Good morning, everyone. Well, my name is Chris Quinn. I'm the youth pastor here at Portland Community Church, and I have the privilege this morning to bring you God's Word. And as Ron said earlier, this is the last message we're going to be doing in the book of Romans. But I want to start this morning by looking at a classic Peanuts cartoon. I love looking at cartoons when I was younger. Uh, so in this particular one, uh, Lucy comes to Linus and she demands that Linus change the channels on the TV, change the channel on the TV, and she threaten him, threatens him with her fist if he doesn't do it. Linus asks her, what makes you think you can walk right in here and take over? These five fingers, says Lucy. Individually, they're nothing, but when I curl them together like this into a single unit, they form a weapon that is terrible to behold. Which channel do you want? Asks Linus. <laughs> Turning away, he looks at his fingers and he says, why can't you guys get organized like that? <laughs> and when we see that story, there actually is a correlating issue that we have with the church and, and Christianity. Not just our church, but church in general, across the entire world. Christ church, where we have trouble unifying together under a common purpose. And one of, I think, the barriers of unity is the fact that we have these differing opinions on what I'm going to call for the rest of this sermon, gray area issues. We have these differing opinions on things that the Bible is not really all that clear on. And so what we do is we have a tendency, because we're human beings, to build ourselves and put ourselves into little camps where we say, this is the right way to think about this, and this is the only way that we can think about this. And other people say, no, this is the way that's right. This is the way that we need to think about this. And we start to divide, and it disrupts the unity of the church and disrupts the ability for us to glorify God and bring Christ to the world. And so these things could be things uh, of the issue of, like, are Christians okay to drink alcohol or worship? styles that we might have, whether modern or traditional, contemporary, or I've even seen this happen, the color of the paint in the sanctuary, or the color of the carpet, things like that could divide us, or even to the point of rated R, whether we watch rated R movies, or uh, TV mature television, sh television shows, or listening to music that's not made by Christians. These are all kinds of gray area issues that we don't know what to do with. And so here's what we're going to talk about this morning. Our main idea for today is that when it comes to gray area issues, we must allow God to be judge, view our personal freedoms as secondary to others' needs, and imitate Christ in, a, in accepting others in their differing opinions. And so today we're going to look at three three mindsets that are needed for Christians to have in order to maintain unity in these gray areas of our faith. So I invite you now to turn to Romans chapter 14. If you need a Bible, there are some brown hard, hardcover back Bibles in the seat in front of you. Turn to page 1138 to join in with us on that. But I'm going to give us a little bit of background about where we've been. So in chapters 12 and 13 of the book of Romans, Paul kind of starts to lay out and mention to us several different components components that make up uh, God's perfect and pleasing will, how a, Christian, how a Christian's life can be characterized as a follower of Christ and, and those that have been renewed by the gospel, whose minds have been renewed by Jesus himself. And so one of the things that happened in the Roman church is you had Jewish Christians coming in who, follow, who followed Jesus, but they had some of their own kind of old taboos that they were having a hard time letting go of. But you also had Gentiles who were coming in that didn't have those same kind of taboos. And so you had this really different cult, these different cultures and backgrounds kind of coming into one church trying to be united as one. And so what, one of the main reasons Paul wrote this book was to cross that dividing line so that people could be united within the church. And so he addresses two different groups in this section and he calls them the strong and the weak. And so when we look at who the weak are, likely the best explanation is that they were Jewish Christians, like I said earlier, had trouble letting go of some taboos that they had in their life in terms of dietary restrictions or, uh, or, or special days that they might celebrate. So they had a really hard time letting those go because they were so deeply ingrained into their culture. And then you have Gentile Christians would be characterized as the strong who came in without those same things. And so now there's this back and forth between what is right, what is wrong, and so Paul is going to address. And so I want to make sure to say that when we talk about strong and weak, he's not necessarily like denoting that there is a spiritual superiority here. He's more just talking about whether they have a weakness in a particular area 
And so the strong need to help build them up is what he's going to talk about. And we need to make sure to understand as well, these were not issues that were black and white. These are, like I said, gray area issues because there are black and white issues in Christianity that has to do with things like the gospel, who Jesus is, why he came, what he came to do. Some of those kinds of things, they are non-negotiable, but some of these things are a little bit more negotiable about how a Christian lives their life for Christ once they have given their life to him. And this can go across a large spectrum when it comes to entertainment choices, political leanings, theological differences on things that are not as certain that the Bible isn't as clear on. And so that's where we are for this morning. Let's go ahead and start Romans 14, 1 through 12. And we're gonna do the first four verses to start. Except the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand for the Lord is able to make them stand. And so Paul wants to make something very clear here, that if someone has these weak parts of their faith where they uh, are still kind of can't seem to let go of those old practices from their old culture, we need to let them do it. Because look at what Paul says. This is, these are disputable matters. He, he means matters of opinion. And so one commentary I read in preparing for this uh, sermon, he, they mentioned that probably what was happening is the weak Christians were being excessively careful. They were being excessively scrupulous about their choices that they were making. And so they kind of, and Paul is kind of critiquing it a little bit here, but we do as Christians need to remember, we do have to be pretty scrupulous because we want to please God with the way that we live. But there is a point where we go a little bit too far. And so again, he makes this very clear that these are matters of opinion. And so in verses two through four, he then makes it very clear though, if, the, if a person really feels like in their conscience that this is something that they absolutely cannot do, cannot go for, then the person on the strong side needs to go ahead and let them do that. Okay, and, and when he talks about the faith that is weak, he says they eat only vegetables. What they were probably doing is the fact that they were living in Rome, these Jewish Christians, and they wouldn't know of a reliable, necessary a reliable place to get meat from that would fulfill their laws about having clean meat to eat. So that instead, they just said, no, instead, we're just going to eat vegetables, just try and stay away. But Paul makes it very clear. So the person on the strong side who can eat everything must not look down and have contempt towards the person on the weak side and say, wow, you are not living this right. You are, you're being ridiculous. Stop doing that. But he says on the other side of the coin, the person who is on the weak side should not be looking down on them and judging them and saying, oh, you don't really know Jesus. You don't really have a relationship with him because you do these certain things. And he makes it very clear about why that is. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? You can't stand here and take the place of God. That's what he means by judging, is to take the place of God and to start to say what, what their actual spiritual quality is because God is the one who is their master and God might be the one who is telling them to have that little conscience issue and we need to let them. God is their master, not us. We are not and we need to let God be the one who leads them in these ways. And so this is the first issue. He goes over food as one of these issues that they were probably disagreeing on. Then we move to verse five and we see a second one. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. And so on one side, you might have the weak Christians who would say, you know, the Sabbath, that's a really important day. Those festivals that we have celebrated for, you know, thousands of years, those are really important. We're going to keep those. And Paul and the Gentiles were coming in and they were saying, well, we didn't grow up with that. That's maybe not all that important to us. We don't need to celebrate those. But look at how Paul categorizes this like at the end of verse five. 
each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. And he creates this standard that it's a conscience thing, that you need to be convinced in your own mind that this is right on either side. You need to be convinced of it. And he kind of piggybacks a little bit back to verse three with verse six, where he says, whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord. So it's this whole thing of, these people, both sides are devoting these kinds of things, their perspectives, their opinions, they're devoting them to the Lord and they get both give thanks to God. This is all about giving this over to God. But then look at verse seven. For none of us lives for ourselves alone and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. And so what Paul is doing here is he's making it very clear that what our, our number one focus always should be that my life, because I have given my life to Christ, is devoted to the Lord solely, completely. That's it. My life is his. It is not about, okay, now I've given my life to Christ. I am now free to go and do whatever I want. That's not the point. A Christian's freedom, a Christian's liberty is to be worked out in terms of serving the same Lord who died and returned to life for them so that they can have a new life. Whatever we do, we live for the Lord or we die for the Lord. We give our lives completely to him. And, and so our, our freedoms become very secondary. And we'll talk about that more a little bit later. But then he goes back to the judging, the judging idea in verse 10. Look at this. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. And this is where this all kind of settles in is that with whatever our opinions are, whatever side we might fall on, on a gray area issue, we are all going to have to stand before God and give an account for the way that we lived our life. And I like to think of it kind of like a performance review at your work. Now, those are pretty uncomfortable for most people, okay, where you, you're, you're being evaluated on your work and you don't want to walk out of that meeting having it be a poor review, even though you get to keep your job. What's, at, what's not at stake in this judgment seat for those of us who put our faith in Christ is not our eternal destiny. That is sealed, signed, delivered. We are spending eternity with Jesus. But God will someday evaluate the way that we lived our life, how we shared the message of Christ, how we endured for Christ in the midst of this broken world, how we lived for him in our moral decisions and behaviors, the things that are these gray area issues. And so we are going to have to stand before God. And what Paul is essentially saying here is, then don't be the one that takes the judgment seat from God. Don't be the one that becomes, that, that thinks you can be the judge. And so this leads us to our first mindset is that we need to allow God to be the judge of fellow believers over these gray area issues. Because a lot of times people come from, come to Christ from all kinds of different cultural backgrounds like we have with the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians in that, in the Roman church. And so we have to understand something. We always need to understand why people might have the beliefs and opinions that they do. For example, when you think about Jewish Christians in the first century, it would have been not just very difficult to tell them, hey, you're free to eat pig now. You're, a f you're free to eat pork. Thank the Lord for Jesus, we can have bacon, right? Like, and that, so you get to, in telling them that, they might go, wait, no, 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 no thanks. I've grown up with this. I'm not gonna do it. But here's the reality, like to, I, I've been reading this book recently called Misreading Scripture Through Western Eyes. It's this fascinating look at how we have cultural biases as Westerners, as we, how we filter through Scripture, and that what we need to start doing is removing those things and try and see it how Easterners would have seen. There are things that we just miss because we're Westerners that were plainly obvious to people who grew up in those cultures. And so one of the things for them is things like, eating pork would not have just been something that was very difficult, like, oh, I got to muscle this thing down. It's like, like almost for us when we see someone in another culture eating like rats or dogs and we go, oh, nope, pass, no thanks, where they physically are repulsed by the idea. So this is a huge ask for people. And so that's why we need to take time to 
allow for them, allow God to be the judge of their spiritual condition and, allow, and try and understand where people are coming from about these things. But also we need to understand that our choices in these areas are based in the fact that not just that we are free to do whatever we want, but as Paul says, we belong to the Lord. And so our question should always be when it comes to these issues for ourselves, how am I going to use, how am I going to do this to live for the Lord? Not just how far can I go before I cross that line, but how am I devoting my time so that it is for the Lord? And then lastly, it's, it's not, it's kind of simplistic to say to people, uh, don't judge. Because there's, there's a different standard within the Bible, a little more nuanced opinion of that. What, what we would think of that is we shouldn't take the place of God and become judge and condemn people before knowing them. That's kind of the whole point of what, what the Bible's talking about. But the Bible does say that we can have righteous judgments where we come to a brother or sister in Christ and we say, hey, I think this is an area you really need to work on and, I'm, and you do it out of humility and love. Jesus would say to take the plank out of your eye before you talk about the speck in, speck in your brother or sister's eye. Okay, first of all, that you deal with your big sin issue before you deal with whatever is in your brother or sister. So you do that in humility, you do that in love, but you don't do it in taking God's place and being the one who is the ultimate judge about their actual spiritual condition. And so what we talk, when we talk about judging here, we're, that's what we're talking about. Don't, don't send people away, but we can have opinions about things, about the way the, way the world is working right now and how people might be living and say, you know, that, that's not right. But we still act in love and we still act in humility, recognizing that we are sinners as well. Let's continue. Verse 13. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it is unclean. So he says, because God is the, is the ultimate judge and we are not, let's not pass judgment. Let's not take God's place and try and be judge. And instead, our mentality needs to be, I am not going to put anything in front of my brother or sister in Christ that will cause them to stumble. One of the great examples we can think of in our day is if I ha say I had an, an alcoholic friend, it would be a very bad idea to care for my alcoholic friend that has just come to Christ and I'm trying to help help them grow to take them to a bar with me if we were going to go out somewhere to eat. That's a very bad idea because I would be putting a stumbling block in front of them. Or even Paul would even say later on in this section that I shouldn't even have like alcohol in his presence like anywhere, even my own home. Because I, and, the, and what he means here is, I want to make up my mind that my point is, it's not about my freedoms, it's about taking care of my brother or sister in Christ, making sure that nothing will hinder them and cause them to fall. And Paul makes this very clear, he says, I am convinced, nothing is unclean. And this actually comes from Acts chapter 10, where Peter has this vision, and this sheet comes down, and all these animals come down, and God says, take, eat, and Peter like a good first century Jewish person said, no, 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 I can't. Nope, I can't do that. And God is giving him a vision, letting him know that, hey, I want you to pursue the Gentiles. This is a part that the gospel is for them as well. But Paul has another caveat here where he says, but if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it's unclean. So he creates this, uh, this category of what we call a conscience issue where a person would say, you know, uh, on the weak side, they'd say, you know, that, that particular thing, I can't, I just can't do that. That's not for me. I can't go there because it leads me to stumble. And what he's saying here is the person on the strong side needs to say, okay, all right, I won't push that. I won't put anything in front of you. Because look at what he says. Here's what happens if you do put something in front of them that causes them to stumble. Verse 15, if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. And so what he's doing here is he's creating this standard that if you distress your brother or sister in Christ because of something that you are strong in, but they might be weak in, that you are actually not acting in the 
cardinal principle of the Christian faith, which is love. You're acting more in selfishness. And so he says, don't, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ died. And then don't let something that you think is good be spoken of as evil because you're putting it in front of somebody who truly can't handle it. And he makes sure to clarify something because the, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not about being able to be free to do whatever you want. It is about living for the kingdom of Jesus, that it brings righteousness, it brings peace, it brings joy into this world in the Holy Spirit, doing the work in people's hearts and minds. And that this is the point of why we are here. We are not freed by Christ to simply live for however we want, but to live for Jesus. We belong to the Lord. And it's not about being able to go into these gray area issues and be able to do what we feel is right, but it is about bringing God's righteous kingdom to this earth. That is what we we need to be focusing on. We need to be focusing more on those things rather than pleasing ourselves. And when we do that, when we focus more on bringing the kingdom in our lives and bringing kingdom into other people's lives, our brothers and sisters in Christ, this way, he says, anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God. This is a pleasing mentality to God and it receives human approval. This goes to people, like this is about people on the outside of the church who would look at the church and say, wow, those people are living in unity even though they have very differing opinions on things. That's different from the world because most people fight and argue about those things. And I think that's one of the reasons why Christians in America have had a very difficult time sharing the gospel and seeing things, seeing people come to Christ is because there is a lot of disunity within churches about some of these issues. And so people look at Christians and go, no, they're just, they're just the same like everybody else. So what, what's the, what is, what difference does Jesus really make? And so instead we have to have a different mentality. Look at verse 19. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So instead, what we need to do is to seek peace in bringing peace into people's lives, bringing pe- having peace between us, and that we could have mutual edification, that we could encourage one another in our relationship with Christ rather than trying to uh, encourage someone to move out of their weakness and into this strength and, and trying to change them for, in something that could be really a weakness for them. And so we don't want to destroy the work of God simply because of something that is a gray area issue that we could be putting in front of them. And Paul says, all food is clean, but it is wrong for anyone to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. And what I think he's talking about a private thing, or not a private thing, but like eating in front of them, it doesn't mean that you never get to do these things, but it means that you have to be very careful. You have to be very careful and make sure you don't put things in front of someone that could cause them to stumble. And he says, it's better to just stay away from them at all so you don't cause your brother or sister to fall. But I think this all makes sense when we look at verse 22 and 23. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith and everything that does not come from faith is sin. So he says, keep whatever you believe about these things, whatever your opinion comes down to in these things, keep that between yourself and God. Keep that as a private thing. Don't flaunt that around because it's not about you being able to do what you want. It's about you being able to be, to live in the kingdom of God and to build others up for mutual mutual edification and peace. And he says, blessed is the one who is not condemned by what he approves. And so blessed is a person who comes to the place that Paul has come where he says, all is is clean. All, All food is clean. It's fine. We can participate in that. That's okay. But he says, whoever has doubts is condemned. If you even have a a sliver of a doubt in a gray area issue that you are not totally sure, if you're going, "I, I just don't know if I'm if I'm actually pleasing God here, then actually the principle here is then don't do it. And I think we have a tendency in our American culture to do this, is to say, well, until I know for sure that this is something that is wrong and has crossed the line, then I'm just gonna go ahead and keep doing it. But Paul gives us a different standard. He says, when in doubt, don't do it. 
And that's what our mentality needs to be. But when we look at this whole section, the whole point of what Paul is saying here is that, and it's our second mindset, is that personal freedoms are always subordinate to the needs of others in Christ. They're always subordinate. And these these different gray area issues, they're gonna be different in each culture. So for the first century church, it was about the food that they were eating and the way, the, the way that they celebrated days and other kinds of, of things like that. But for us, how do we know which are the ones that are these issues for us? Let me kind of give you an example that I think could help kind of get, get a picture for this. Uh, when I was a youth pastor at a different church, uh, I, I worked at a church where I really felt like there were some people there that had a lot of freedom when it came to uh, entertainment, okay? Where, what movies they watch, TV shows they watch, music they listen to. And at the time, I was trying so hard to belong, to be a part of this, to be a part of this church family that I started to kind of go along with it. But all the while, there were doubts starting to be build up in my mind where I'm going, I'm not sure that this is okay for me. I, I think I actually would categorize myself as weak in that area because I need to have things kind of, I need to be if infiltrated constantly with things that are focused on Jesus because I am very easily distracted as the youth will tell you. Um, and so I need that. And so I, but what ended up happening is because I wanted to belong so badly and I was having such a hard time that I started to see my relationship with Christ suffer because I wanted to belong so bad and I wanted to be a part of this. And so this, I would actually say my relationship with Christ was suffering. And so this was an example where we need to start thinking about these things and say, how do we make sure our brothers and sisters don't fall? But how do we know what is and is not okay on these things, on some things like entertainment and drinking alcohol or the kind of foods that we eat, all of that? How do we know? Well, I think I'm gonna follow the logic of something that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 6, 12. See, the Corinthians were saying things like, I have a right to do anything. But Paul says, you say that, but not everything is beneficial. There are many things in this world that are not beneficial for us. They might actually be neutral, truly, morally neutral. They might not be that big a deal, but if they're not beneficial for you, then that's the question of you say, well, if it's not benefiting me in a way that builds up my relationship with Christ or helps me build up an inroad to have a relationship with someone who isn't a follower of Jesus, then if it's not beneficial, then I need to think about cutting that out of my life. And then secondly, Paul says, I have the right to do anything, but... I will not be mastered by anything. So if there are things in our lives that truly take over and master us so that that's what we're focused on, that's what we're thinking about, that's what we're constantly focused on, then that's where we might need to follow the advice of Jesus and say, I'm gonna cut that thing out of my life because it is mastering me rather than Jesus being my master. And even these neutral things, we need to cast them aside they might not be that big a deal, but if they are not leading us to a closer relationship with Christ, we've got to, that's, we've got to have a very serious standard because these are extremely important. But most of all, what Paul talks about here is that this belief needs to be set on the idea that my personal freedoms come secondary to seeing the kingdom of God being built up in this world and seeing my brothers and sisters in Christ being built up in him. And so I, I love this quote from a commentary I read this week. It says, but the exercise of Christian freedom must always be subordinated to the needs of others. Always because we wanna care for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We wanna build them up. And I think we oftentimes in our culture have such a, we place such a huge value on freedom, being able to do what we want, that I often think it's become a god or an idol to us, that we believe that this is, this is what life is really all about. But freedom for Christians is only as, it good, is only as good as it builds up others in Christ. That is all freedom really can truly be good for is if it builds up others. Let's continue. Chapter 15, verse one. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. 
So notice here that Paul identifies himself with the strong. And so what he says is don't just merely put up with them like, oh my gosh, that person has that issue. Oh, Got to deal with that. What he says is actually to bear with them, actually help them carry the burden of it and build them up, not to please ourselves. Because remember, it's not about our personal freedoms are subordinate to the needs of others. And so we should please our neighbors. We should take care of our neighbors, our brothers and sisters in Christ so that we can build them up so they can walk closer with Christ. And Paul then says in verses three and four that this is something that Christ even did. Christ did not please himself, but instead, as it is written, the insults of those you, who insult you have fallen on me. Christ is, has taken on the insults for the way of not pleasing himself in this world. And so we ought to do the same thing. If, not, if you are, would categorize yourself as a person who is strong, to, not say, to say, I am not going to focus on pleasing myself, but building up my weaker brothers and sisters in Christ and not put stumbling blocks in front of them. And that we have encouragement about that in the past and we can endure in that because this, is, this provides hope that there are greater things, there are more important things to come for us. Look at verse five. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ had so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he enters into this prayer, what he just talked about with endurance and encouragement. And so that he asks for God to give an attitude of mind that it's the same as that Christ had to be willing to not please himself for the better of others. And what he literally means here by saying to have the same attitude of mind, it literally means to think the same thing among one another. To think that same thing among one another as Christ did. To be willing to not please ourselves, but instead bear with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so that when we do that, we can be unified in one mind and one voice to glorify God. But that is kind of implied in there that if we don't do that, if we don't have the same mind, if we are not unified, then we will struggle to glorify God because we are not actively living in the way that God designed the church to be, which is to live in unity together. Disunity damages our ability to glorify God because we are not being the church that God designed us to be. And so then he continues in verse seven. Accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed and moreover that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. So the word accept in our culture, I think, has a very weird connotation to it. It's kind of like saying, you got to take me as I am, but you can't expect me to change. You got to be the one to deal with it because I'm not changing. You just got to accept me. And that's not what Paul is talking about here. When he says to accept, what he's meaning is to receive people into fellowship when they want to believe in Christ. Let them come in. Even if they have these scruples, these things that kind of, these these taboos that they might have that are maybe not the ultimate idea of what Paul was talking about, that we are free in Christ. And what we need to do instead is we need to let them in. And the example is Jesus. Because look at this, and accept one another just as Christ accepted you. This is the beautiful kind of, this is actually the kind of climax of the argument that Paul is making here is to accept and receive one another in faith and not be a judge of one another, not to divide each other over these, these issues, but instead accept each other because Christ did the same for us. That Christ accepted us when we were powerless in our sin. That Christ accepted us when we were enemies of him because of our sin. That Christ accepted us when we were slaves of our sin and he redeemed us and set us free to live for him and he accepted us in order to bring praise to God and to point to him as a loving, compassionate, passionate and just God. So we ought to do the same for others in Christ, despite our differences in these issues. And this all kind of carries over to what Paul says next in verses nine through 12, where he talks about these different Old Testament prophecies that Jesus fulfilled by bringing in the Gentiles and that this was the plan all along. Look at verse 10. Again, it says, rejoice you Gentiles with this people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, 
The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will have hope. And he shows here that Christ came as the Messiah first to confirm what had been promised from the beginning to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the book of Genesis, that there would be this coming Messiah. That's what he came to do. And then that he also would bring the Gentiles in who were separated from God, who were not part of the covenant that God was giving to the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that now they are brought in and that is God's mercy to bring them in because they were separated from him, from him at one point and that this was always the plan. And so for the Jewish Christians of that day, that is what they needed to remember. This has been part of the plan. And so get to work in accepting one another because this is what God has wanted from the beginning. And that Paul closes this section out with a prayer. And he says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit that when we are united together, accepting one another in Christ for who he is and what he has done for us, that we can still accept each other despite our differences in these gray area issues and to love Jesus. And so this leads us to our final mindset is that we need to imitate Christ by accepting one another and building each other up despite differing opinions. And ser some serious questions can arise if we cannot seem to accept one another as Christ has accepted us, simply because we have differing opinions. First of all, you hear in John 13, 34 through 35, Jesus says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Then Apostle John says in 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. And so that becomes the standard. We know that we have become a follower of Christ when we love one another in a radical manner that is different from the rest of the world, even with these gray area issues that we might have differing opinions on. And so we can start, we can end this by thinking in a way, and end this morning where we start to think, you know what? I have not loved my brothers and sisters in Christ in this way. I have judged them. I have shown contempt to them. And this is something that we can do. And today is as good a day as any if you recognize that to say, God, I am sorry. I confess this is my sin. I did this. This is not on anybody else. God, would you forgive me? Jesus, I know you paid for my debt on the cross. You have forgiven me of my sin. And you have accepted me even when I was in my weakest time. And so that's what we need to do. And when we think of 2019, moving into a new resolution, that's what our resolution needs to be, is to say, I'm gonna love my brothers and sisters in Christ and recognize that this is not necessarily something that I can do on my own, that I need the transformation of Christ in my life and in my heart to change me. And so I, we need to be asking in this year to say, I wanna change this. And that we remember what we said at the beginning, that when it comes to these gray area issues, we must allow God to be judge, view our personal freedoms as secondary to others' needs, and imitate Christ in accepting others and their differing opinions. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. God, I'm so thankful that you love us so deeply. And Jesus, that you accepted us in the middle of our sin. You accepted us in the midst of being broken. God, that we were not perfect, but God, you loved us. And so God, we just thank you for this morning. God, I pray that as we continue this morning that we would be giving you praise and glory and that we would be seeking unity with each other. And we pray this in your name, amen.